minutes and welcome you to um, BBB National Programs KRU's conference, Why Diversity and Inclusion is Good for Business. I'm Donna Frazier, Senior Vice President of Privacy Initiatives here at BBB National Programs and your host for today. You can go to the next slide, William. So I just wanna remind people um, about a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, your microphones are muted. Um, the session will be recorded and available online. So you'll receive a link of where to access it after the session has been completed. And if at any time you need technical help, please contact support at bbbnp.org. Um, if you have questions, please use the chat um, box and I'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, if there are relevant questions um, that are um, pertain to a particular presentation in the moment, um, I'll try and interrupt, otherwise we'll address uh, all questions at the end of the presentation. Next slide. So I wanna remind everybody that um, our last KRU conference session is on December 8th um, and about KRU now then and looking forward. So um, for those of you who are interested in all things KRU and what we'll be doing in the future and um, what 2020 looked like for us, um, an interesting year for all of us, I'm sure. Um, but please join Mary Engel and I for an uh, interesting conversation. I'd like to thank our sponsors whom none of this would um, be possible. So um, Google, Hypershift, Keller and Heckman, Microsoft, Super Awesome, Venable, Monat, Baker Hostetler, and Davis and Gilbert. So I want to um, briefly introduce you to our panelists today, all of whom um, are very um, grateful that they were able to do this for us. Um, first, we have Katie Donnelly, who is a global diversity and equity inclusion leader at Verizon. She's responsible for driving the diversity, equity and inclusion strategy there and serves as a strategic partner to business and human resource teams. She identifies opportunities to embed and improve inclusive practices and behaviors throughout the employee lifecycle and business processes. She has 20 years of experience in talent management, supplier diversity, human resource operations, and diversity and inclusion. Um, Katie, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Next, I'd like to welcome Shabna Rezai. Shabna started Big Bad Boo to make quality cartoons. Shows include 16 Hudson, The Bravest Night, Mixed Nuts, Lila and Lola, and 1001 Nights, which airs in 80 countries. Um, based in New York City and Vancouver, the company um, has a channel, Oznaz, did I pronounce that right? Yes. Okay, good. That airs cartoons in various languages um, with a B BS in computer science, a BA in German literature from UPenn and an MBA from NYU. Shabna started her career on Wall Street. She was born in Iran, grew up in Austria and is raising her girls trilingual. Good for you. Um, and last mm -hmm. but not least, we have Michael Nehore. Um, Michael is Vice President of Global Talent and Inclusion at Mattel. His scope includes talent acquisition, talent management, HR technology, and diversity and inclusion across the 60 plus countries that Mattel operates in. Um, during his time at Mattel, he's led the development and launch of Mattel University, redefined their talent and engagement practices, and has been involved in shaping one of the biggest cultural turnarounds in the company's history towards becoming a purpose-led organization. Um, so I want to thank all of you. Um, obviously, diversity and inclusion is um, top of mind for I think many organizations, especially this year. Um, for us here at BBB National Programs, it's definitely something that um, is also top of mind for both our CEO, Eric Rayson, and the organization as a whole. Um, this year we had, um, we started a diversity, inclusion, and belonging committee that I co-chair with Mary Engel. Um, proud to do so, and we're making some really good strides. Um, what we'll talk about here today is, again, why diversity and inclusion is good for business. So I will turn it over to Katie Donnelly. Thank you. Next slide, please. Hello. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Verizon, in, in, just in case you, you're not aware, which we're the largest telecom company in the world. Um, but who we are, we, we promise to deliver on the digital world by enhancing the ability of humans, businesses, and society to do more new and do more good. Um, we transfer, what we do is we transform people, businesses, and things and how they connect to each other 
Um, we drive innovation, communications, and technology solutions, and how we work. So we work with. Um, sorry. Okay, our core purpose guides the positions that we take when we when it comes to policy issues relevant to our customers, our employees, and our business. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, about two or three years ago, we had a new CEO step upon and take the lead of Verizon, and he restructured the business into four key stakeholders, and they're represented here. It's our employees, our customers, society, and our shareholders, and he views all four as equal, equally important. So we were tasked with developing a DNI strategy that could be a business enabler, strategically led throughout the organization, and to make an impact. It's not a standalone or nice to have, it's, it's a business imperative. So how we define diversity is really the uniqueness everyone brings um, and who they are from their life experiences, where they live, all the differences that um, make you into who you are. And, it's, and we try to leverage those perspectives. Equity is having access, opportunity, and support. And um, we realize that there's some parts through the employee life cycle where um, we can you know, build upon better equity. And equity really is about removing the barriers around things that, um, and leveling the playing field for people. Inclusion is really about belonging. So you feel that you're valued for who you are, you're connected, um, you're authentic, that you can show up as your true self, and that you're empowered and you're contributing your full potential to Verizon. So if these are all very important, especially the belonging and the authenticity, because if some if someone's trying to hide a, a part of themselves, and and generally the internal non-visible things have more of an impact, they're expelling about 30% of their energy trying to hide a part of them, and we really want to be able to let them give their 100% to work to their job so we can really leverage their insights and perspectives. So everything we do in our businesses is are aligned to these four stakeholders. Uh, so, uh, and it's, it starts from the top down and we have, an or, we have the strategy going across the global footprint and then each into the five business units and then down in through the organization through the ERGs, our employee resource groups. But our, uh, four stakeholders are our employees. So it's important that, you know, we have a culture that's inclusive, that um, we identify opportunities to have diverse employees because they're, and that they're engaged and we have the best workforce because it's imperative that you have a workforce that's reflective of your customer base. Those insights to be leveraged around product development, um, finding solutions to problems within the businesses and all that. So um, your employees are your most important commodity in your organization. So, and when we leverage the employees insights to improve everything with our customers. So we build upon our brand and our reputation uh, as a leader in DNI, and this makes us become a provider of a choice for our customers. And that grows our market share. And society, it's about fostering uh, economic inclusion and, and drive positive changes in the communities that we serve. And this is all about access, equity, and opportunity. And this is where we partner with the foundation, Verizon's foundation, to really drive uh, improvements into the communities that we serve. And this is also our supplier diversity arm. So Verizon spends $5 billion a year on average with minority women-owned and veteran businesses. So it's uh, our commitment to diversity and inclusion is woven through everything. And then if we care for all three of these things, our, our shareholders, uh, we're accountable to them to drive profitability and 
by measuring all the the impact of this strategy, the shareholders get the shareholders receive great results. And by leveraging all these stakeholders, it drives customer rele relevance, it drives innovation and growth, and it differentiates our brand with our customers and develop trust with our customers. Because it's really important that your uh, employee brand matches your customer branding. So when they are leveraging their um, cell phones, everything, they look at us as a possibly an employer of choice. Next slide, please. So um, this year, we pivot after the murder of George Floyd to really develop a racial justice um, strategy within the organization. And these are the three pillars that we aligned around, you know, continuing the conversation, uh, listening and learning, making sure we had resources for our managers. So we developed a, a, a toolkit, a racial equity and justice toolkit that was on VC web. Also developed a learning plan around racial equity and justice so employees could go there and really broaden their cultural competency around the racial injustice in this uh, in the United States. Um, we brought in thought leaders um, to have a series of discussions with experts around racial equity, what, um, what our uh, non-Black employees could do to help and really make uh, Verizon accountable to not only our employees, but society and making an impact. And then our bold ERG is our African-American Black ERG. Um, they hosted very courageous conversations uh, where people were very transparent and it just blossomed from there where people started having conversations that they would not normally have at work and really getting people to understand their, uh, what they may not know, what they didn't know, um, and clocking their um, unconscious bias. And then the third pillar, uh, the second pillar is build a strong organization, really assessing our, our outreach around diverse hiring, re-examining partnerships and, and acquiring new partnerships and really look at it from the minute and a, a potential candidate looks at our site all the way through the life cycle of the employee. And um, training on unconscious bias and being an ally, we developed uh, unconscious bias was required across the organization. And then we're building upon that. We developed a, a course called Conscious Inclusion and Anti-Racism. It's a uh, four hour course and really gets into um, how to be an anti-racist, not, not just be consciously inclusive, but also how to specifically be an anti-racist. And then all of this helps us um, build a pipeline of leaders, really identifying your biases into promotions of women, people of color and other um, underrepresented groups. And then the ERGs, there was a lot of trauma in the organization. so. We set up EAP, Police Assistant Program and Support Groups. And then the community engagement is the financial support that we, we gave to organizations. So we made a $10 million commitment to Black-led organ, uh, black organizations around um, social justice, voting reform, voting information, all of that. And then how we really partnered with the foundation was the volunteer platform. So our employees were coming to us saying, what can I do, what can I do? So we partnered with the foundation and organizations to have opportunities for our employees to volunteer and impact whatever demographic they wanted. So they, our foundation partnered with our Black ERG for Black organization volunteer opportunities, the LGBT, Q for LGBTQ volunteer opportunities. And at right now, as of the end of October, we have generated 125,000 volunteer hours. And then really driving innovation and learning in schools, especially with the pandemic, really making sure that, um, that everyone has access, fair and equitable internet, the tools they needed and really partnering with um, underserved schools to drive that. And by doing that and getting 
elementary school, we also can start driving the STEM um, opportunities in their head, like, oh, they can do this. They'll, they'll see themselves reflected in our employees. And then our civil engagement is around voting and uh, social justice reform. So in partnership with our ERGs and the foundation, um, we really went out and educated our employees around voting and um, how they can get involved in social justice reform. Next slide. So this is um, when I talked to you about, I mentioned in the, on the previous slide about the racial equity and justice skill learning plan that I developed in, in response to uh, need in the organization. So uh, prior to the racial equity and justice learning plan, I had developed a DNI resource site. So this housed all the information around our DNI for employees, the business, and, and, and how it can be leveraged across the organization. It included thought leaders, white papers, um, global partnerships that we have, and just to really start uh, growing the cultural competency throughout the organization. And then um, the other two are just related to the ERGs. Our executive sponsor, every one of our CEO's direct reports is an executive sponsor of our ERGs. So that's a plan to really help them learn about best in class practices around engagement of ERGs and, and business plan and all of that assistance. And then the ERG Leadership Academy is for our ERG leaders. We view the, the ERGs as a tremendous source of talent in the organization and it gets allows people to shine and do stretch things and also grow their their skill set in the thing in ways that they may not in their day job. Next slide please. Um, these are our ERGs and um, we we have used them as am ambassadors around the diversity, equity, and inclusion within Verizon. So um, they align all their activities around our four stakeholders and our DNI strategy. And then they go out into the organization and spread the impact that they can make. They also bring um, opportunities and projects back from the business to us so we can solve for them and they're leveraged. You know, one of the things that we did that uh, our senior vice president in our global network and technology, Nikki Palmer, had a hacking um, project that she asked that ERG represent leaders be involved in assessing the winners of these organizations and, and or the best projects and really help them look at it from a diverse lens. Um, we have 26,000 ERG participants, which um, reflects about 20% of our employee population. Next slide. So in terms of uh, global, this is, these are projects that the global diversity and inclusion and equity teams that are globally um, across the organization uh, where we you know, manage the strategy of the ERGs. Here are some of the projects that we're doing in partnership. So one of the things we did this year was huge. Um, we kept getting requests from the business as well as our ERG leaders around workforce data. So uh, Hans and our, our chief HR officer have a commitment to transparency. And we just released our workforce data both internally and externally. And very few people, companies are doing this, about 20 companies are doing it. And it just shows that we are committed to DNI, making sure we have diverse talent and accountable for it. And then um, this, this next um, opportunity is our new human capital management system. So myself and the PRISM ERG, which is our LGBTQ, have worked with the vendor with our new HCM system to start capturing data around uh, having a third option for gender, for non-binary gender um, employees, as well as LGBTQ status. It will go completely, uh, maybe gay, lesbian, transgender man, transgender female, however they want to ID, and that's all 
so voluntary, but that's a best in class practice as well. And really um, capability building. So I, when I came to Verizon, I've been there about 18 months, I just automatically put my pronouns in my email signature and it wasn't brand compliant, but people started asking and it started to grow um, the request. So employees were emailing, marketing, branding, asking for this. So we partnered with PFLAG to roll out a gender non-binary training about pronouns and all that with our internal partners. And this did a twofold thing. So employees can now add their pronouns to their email signatures as well as their business cards. And it also helps an understanding of the, the fundamentals around the self ID piece of it. And then, um, we're partnering with an organization called Hollerback around bystander training. And this was really in response to our uh, Asian employees and our customers dealing with harassment of racism around the COVID um, virus. And so this is going to be a tool that's rolled out to our Asian, which is our PACE uh, ERG, and really give them the tools to diffuse situations, address harassment, and then it'll be rolled out to the other ERGs to really ground the organization in understanding how they can um, help stop harassment. Uh, next slide, please. And um, these are the awards that we've won. And the reason why I included these is because a lot of these are external benchmarking surveys and these are a great resource to start learning best in class practices, what is next in line as the best in class practices. And some of these ask for um, engagement with internal stakeholders. So you can really start to develop great conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and people start to realize how it's embedded throughout the organization. And um, it's a way to you know, take a baby step in really starting to assess your DE&I programs and uh, along those lines. Next slide, please. And um, that's it for my presentation. And I provided an overarching you know, people HR focus. And um, our next presenter will be talking about it from an external focus and how she embeds DNI into what she does. Thank you, KV. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shabnam Rezai. I am the co-founder and president of Big Bad Boo Studios. Uh, I have um, started the company uh, about 10 years ago and we're based in New York and Vancouver. Could I get the next slide, please? So um, unlike Verizon, which is a very large company uh, and very global, we are a small production house. Uh, and we also do distribution of our own content. And we also have a multilingual platform called Osnos for children that are being raised multilingual. Um, some of our original content includes shows like Lily and Lola, 1001 Nights, the Bravest Night, which I'll talk about in this presentation, and 16 Hudson, uh, which you can find on Amazon Prime video if any of you have kids and have Amazon Prime. Um, we have, um, typically we delve into uh, animated television series for kids, preschool and older age group. And our original programs have aired in over 120 countries around the world. We also create games and um, virtual reality experiences for children, um, as well as uh, Osnos, which as I mentioned, has about 120 different types of shows in 15 different languages. And it's similar to Netflix in that it's a subscription-based platform. Next. So today, oh, sorry, this is the trailer for um, The Bravest Night. We're just gonna watch this clip. 
Are you ready for your lesson in becoming a knight? I'm ready. Um, my name is Cedric. <clears throat> I'm a not yet knight. So, you're the pumpkin knight? I'm here to take your throne! So the bravest knight is uh we can go to the next slide the bravest knight is a show that we've um, produced in partnership with hulu it's a hulu original series the first of its kind in the kids section um, the show has won the mipcom diversify tv awards in the lgbtq category as well as the glad media awards this year and similar to um, Katie, I'm mentioning this because some of you out there might be interested in finding out about what types of awards can bring, can shed light on the work that you're doing. Um, so typically at Big Bad Boo, the types of shows that we're inter interested in are not just high quality shows, but shows that are featuring underrepresented communities. And The Bravest Night is a great example of that. Um, it's the story of a little girl named Nia who has been adopted by her two dads. Um, Cedric the Knight, who's in the orange, and Prince Andrew. Uh, in the backstory, which is a book written by Daniel Errico, um, Cedric, who is a pumpkin farmer as a little boy, dreams to one day grow up and become a knight. And after going through many adventures and working very hard to become a knight, he saves a prince and a princess who are brother and sister from a red dragon. And at the end of that venture, the queen and king want to uh, re reward him and ask him what he wants as a reward. Will it be riches? He says, no. Will it be our daughter's hand in marriage? And he says, no. And they say, well, what do you want, Cedric? And he says, well, I would very much like your son's hand in marriage. So at the end of that storybook, Cedric and Prince Andrew get married. And that leads up to our series, which is set up, um, as I mentioned, with the family formation that you see on your screen. Um, every episode, we flash back to when Cedric is a young pumpkin farmer and he goes through his adventures with a purple troll named Grunt, uh, played by Bobby Moynihan from Saturday Night Live. And as they go through their adventures, they come across known villains such as the big bad wolf only our wolf is not very big bad uh, he's actually just misunderstood and he's played by rupaul next slide please <laughs> so um in discussing diversity and how we try and achieve that both in front of the screen and behind the screen and throughout our production line and in our offices we always hope to match everything front to back. And I've just put up a slide of um, some of our actors and how we try and match the actual characters in the show with the people that are voicing the roles. So for example, um, both T.R. Knight and Wilson Cruz are gay, they're in relationships, and they are obviously huge advocates for the LGBTQ community. And so they are playing the, the prince and the, and the, and the knight. Um, you may have heard of Wanda Sykes, RuPaul, um, you know, these uh, voices sort of match the characters that we have created in the series. And we make great effort to be authentic with matching the behind the scenes to the front of the scenes. Next. Um, I'm gonna show you now four short clips that also illustrate how we weave diversity and inclusion into the content. So they're very subtle things that we think children need to be exposed to and grow up with. And um, they are just a small part of the catalog. They never take over the story. The storylines are always adventurous. In this particular episode, 
um, Cedric and Grant happen upon two um, fairies. And here's a little clip from when the fairies bring them back into their treehouse. Thank you for your help. Here, let me get your pouches. We'd rather have an introduction. Of course. My name is Lucy, and the fairy you helped is named Lily. This is Grunt, and I'm Cedric. I'm a not yet knight. How nice for you. Lucy, isn't that a girl's name? Names belong to people, not genders. <sighs> this tea is making me sleepy. How about you? Not me. I'm completely awake. So that was a great example of um, a fairy whose name was Lucy and, um, you know, Troll being, Grunt being uh, the character that he is, kind of calling that out and saying, well, you know, gendered names should belong to gendered people and, and just very happenstance, he responds that no, anyone can have any name they like. Um, next. Here are two clips around language. I'm gonna go ahead and have you play it. What do you care about getting inside anyway? Don't you see? If we could talk with the queen and king, we could tell them we know where the dragon lives. You're right. Then they could send the knights to Clarent and we'd be rid of the dragon once and for all. Yeah, but how are we supposed to get inside? It would take a miracle. Or a carriage. Here you go. So that was very subtle. Again, uh, we said queen and king. And in the English language, as everyone knows, we typically say king and queen. So we're thinking, you know, our brains are programmed to think a certain way and they are gender biased. And so by trying to undo some of that language in our minds, maybe we can all be more open to having a more equal and equitable um, society. Um, next clip. My, my, my name is Nia. I, I'm a not yet knight. <sighs> How may I be of assistance? Ah. <laughs> Sailor? Grunt? Hi, Nia. We're making some of my favorite. Troll stew. I, I thought someone was in distress. They will be if they taste that stew. I am glad you didn't try to fight them. A hero doesn't look for problems. She looks for solutions. Spoken like a true knight. Of course, here Nia is our main character and she's a great example for girls to look up to in terms of female empowerment. Um, RBG was famously asked, when will there be enough women on the court? And she said, when there are nine. And it's with that belief that we uh, always try and have um, gender balance. Um, and sometimes, you know, over, over gender characters in the show to try and um, show that anybody can do anything. And it's not just a, a gender issue. It's also all the other things that we look for in diversity. And, and when we make content, some of the things we look for are, um, you know, age, gender, shape, size, um, sexual orientation, color, physical ability, uh, neural ability, language, and culture. So we have a grid that we always look for when we're creating content to make sure that we are very aware and conscious of uh, being inclusive in our, in our writing. And the final clip I'll show you uh, next is um, about prejudice. So let's play that. Yes? You did it! It was easy! I swam straight through into the courtyard! Come on, let's go! What's with this tiny door? It's called a troll door. Old castles used to make trolls use them instead of the main entrance. That's terrible. Yep. When I get my own castle, there's only gonna be one door for everyone. Next slide. So yeah, when I get my own castle, there's just gonna be one entrance for everyone. Uh, that's how it kind of works backstage in our production crews. These are some pictures of our offices and our 
staff. Um, we're always gender balanced in the writing room. We try and hire from all different cultures and nationalities and types of people. Um, we believe that it's really important to do that, not just for creating really good com content, having more interesting opinions, um, deeper, vaster ideas, um, making the content more sticky and having a greater reach, but also for the children that are watching it to feel represented, to feel heard, to feel seen, and ultimately to be validated. So for us, those are all the reasons that um, inclusion is super important. Next. Uh, I just put up some of the values that are core to Big Bad Boo Studios. I've touched upon these um, in, the, in the slides previous. We'll go to the last slide. And uh, one of the last things I wanted to mention, if you just um, go to the next one as well, is um, in the conferences that we are in, um, go ahead and click again, um, where we get referred to a lot as being diverse content. And um, I just wanna point out to the audience that we prefer terms like inclusive and representative. While we talk about cast and crew being diverse, meaning being from different backgrounds, we hope that our content anyway is um, as mass as anyone else's and right up there in terms of quality and calling it diverse implies that it's different. So um, we hope that our content is inclusive and representative and take great measures to do that. And I've shown some examples of that. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Michael who's here from Mattel and I hope Michael has enough time to do his presentation. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Shabnam. All right. Uh, no, we should we should be good. Uh, you know, it's interesting just listening to my co-presenters here, as Katie said, um, I think what you'll see is a lot of the themes being duplicated. And, and I think that's a really good thing because it means that we're we're all leveraging the same strengths in our respective areas of of the world, if you will. So uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, Mattel, uh, we are uh, actually celebrating our 75th year. Uh, this year, our 75th anniversary. And, you know, in many ways, we are a house of brands, uh, but uh, also a branded house. And so while, you know, Barbie and Fisher Price and Hot Wheels are, are common, um, you know, attributions to, to our company, you know, we do span across that and, you know, action figures, games, um, uh, you know, and the entire license world, uh, and then more recently our foray uh, in, a, in a much more pronounced way into content. But purpose has been kind of the guiding principle of our company um, really since its inception uh, in a garage. Uh, so with that, it's, it's sort of apropos uh, that we're talking about this topic of, of inclusion and, and diversity. So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, it's, if we talk about the business case uh, for DNI or diversity and inclusion, you know, there's, there's, the numbers have been out there for a long time, but, you know, they're just getting more and more compelling and more and more interesting. You know, if we just take a few of these, if you look at, you know, just the, the increases in innovation from having diverse man management teams up to 40%. And then, you know, more recently, HBR <clears throat> had some compelling research around you know, actual bottom line profit, like actual growth, uh, upwards of 30% for leaders, companies that are leaders in this space. And then for those of us, which is likely many on this call uh, who hire anybody, you don't even have to be in HR, um, you know, job seekers, you know, are really stating that diversity is an important factor, upwards of 70%. The interesting fact about that from Glassdoor is that's from 2018. So you can only imagine what that number is now with the cultural conversation where it is and the importance of DNI where it is. So, uh, so I think the business case definitely speaks for itself. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, much like, uh, you know, Katie had also spoken, if you click through one more time, William, um, you know, we think about it somewhat the same as, as diversity is really that organizational level, right? That's it's representation of of people, and and we sometimes refer to that as you know counting your people, but inclusion in some ways is much more higher order, right? It's about the individual, and and we call that making your people count. That is the 
you know, environment where people can thrive and truly <clears throat> sort of quote unquote, bring their whole selves to work. And so, you know, I think historically DNI has gotten, you know, a bit of a bad rap, if you will, because the focus has been, and, and I think, you know, Mattel in its past is, is probably, you know, um, has done this as well. You know, the focus has really been on diversity without an inclusive culture. And, you know, if you don't have the two, um, and if you don't have that inclusion, then you're really just, you know, hiring diverse people without uh, a, a culture or an environment where they can truly thrive. And it's a difficult balance by, by all means. So if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> you know, more rec recently, we've been really leaning in, and this is the internal view of what we've been doing. Again, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of this the same stuff we're using you know employee resource groups where we're really trying to take that global now which is a really interesting when you think about you know what diversity means in other cultures um, is is very different and that starts becoming uh, you know an interesting dialogue as a as a company um, you know transparency of course around our DNI goals and building that training and awareness um, you know more recently we've we've really fundamentally rethought our talent acquisition, specifically in the US, um, you know, things like removing um, educational requirements, um, you know, from incoming candidates has, you know, opens us up to non-traditional candidates that may have had a path that isn't the traditional MBA or design degree. Um, and so we're finding that not only just for the sake of diversity, but really just broadening our talent pool. Um, and then, of course, our commitment uh, to DNI, which we call our Playfair Initiative, which is our external commitment for what we're doing around um, racial equality. So, if we go to the next slide, um, then you know, thinking about if that's what we're doing from a um, you know internal standpoint, how we have and continue to bring diversity and inclusion uh, to life through our products is something you know I think we feel quite proud of, um, especially this last we'll call it decade. Um, you know, for those that, that are aware, uh, you know, several years back, you know, our, in our doll category, we made sort of headway around, or I should, sorry, I should say headlines around, you know, bringing diverse um, dolls to the market, right? Where non-traditional body types, colors, hairstyles to really be representative of, uh, of the, the outside world. Um, you know, things like how we're combating gender stereotypes through our infant um, and preschool play um, using neutral colors instead of traditional, you know, blue is for boy and boy toys, pink is for pink, you know, pink toys, because as, you know, for those of us that know it, at these ages, uh, you know, children, you know, are quite impressionable for what uh, gender is uh, and isn't. And so with that, um, you know, the launch of our creatable world, which, you know, really went at the heart of gender stereotyping and bringing that inclusivity in, um, you know, was another really proud moment for us. And then, you know, last but not least, uh, you know, just one example across games as we think about accessibility, you know, Uno, uh, we released a Braille version. So, um, you know, just some examples uh, of how we're, we're, we're doing it, you know, in our day to day and, and bringing it to life through our products. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> you know, uh, Barbie at the end of the day is a cultural lightning rod. And, you know, the team has been incredible at, you know, using that for good and sometimes leaning into that. And, you know, it has been controversial at times and at times has, you know, led uh, the cultural conversation. And, you know, one of those examples, if we go to the next slide, um, you know, as we think about, you know, this isn't anything new, um, you know, with 176 different dolls, uh, body types, skin tones, hairstyles, the diversity has been there. And as I mentioned on some of the previous uh, lines, you know, we're also seeing that uh, just as a, as a nice uh, uh, bonus here, where our diverse lines are actually outperforming uh, our traditional dolls. Um, and again, if you think about representation, so, you know, last year, uh, you know, the, the doll in the wheelchair and our black fashionista doll, our Kirby black fashionista doll actually were our top selling dolls 
you know, no surprise, I know to those in the team, uh, but it's, it's, it's heartening, uh, but also, um, you know, an important moment for us as we think about, you know, what the future is. And so with that, as we talked about utilizing that, that cultural lightning rod, um, you know, especially more recently, if we go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to play a, a, a clip in a moment here about, um, you know, the recent conversation around, um, you know, racial equity um, from George Floyd um, through, you know, across the board. And, and now this is, you know, much more of a global conversation. You know, parents are having difficulty having this conversation in some cases. And children, of course, are having difficulty just understanding the influx of information that is out there. And so, um, you know, uh, like, like any influencer, Barbie has a blog. And, uh, you know, in this particular one, <clears throat> what we'll see in a moment is Barbie and her friend Nikki having a, quite a, um, a transparent conversation uh, around racism. And, you know, what we saw is just an, an incredible um, reception uh, to kind of leading this cultural conversation through this, through this iconic brand. And so let's go ahead and play the clip. Hey, everybody. Hey, everyone. So there is a huge movement going on. People, millions of people across the world are standing up to fight against racism. And they're doing this because too often and for such a long time, people have been treated unfairly and in some cases even hurt by others because of the color of their skin. This stuff isn't easy to talk about, which is exactly why we have to talk about it. It's a tough conversation, but I'm glad we're having it. People might think that my life looks fine, but the truth is I and so many other black people have to deal with racism all the time. It's really hurtful and it can be scary and sad. And I wanted to share some stories about that today. Barbie and I had a sticker selling contest on the beach last month. We split up and went different directions to see who could sell the most. Well, while I was on the boardwalk, beach security stopped me three times. What? They asked me all these questions over and over, and they even called my mom. <gasps> I never told you, but that's why I sold a few stickers that day. The security officers thought I was doing something bad, even though I was doing exactly what you were doing. And remember when we were going to join that French honor club at school? Mm -hmm. Well, I made a perfect score on the entrance test, but when the teacher, who didn't know me at all, gave me my results, he told me I only did well because I got lucky. He said he knew I couldn't speak French that well. What? You speak French better than all of us. Why didn't you just stay in the club and prove him wrong? I don't want to have to constantly prove and reprove myself. He supported you right from the beginning and didn't support me. Usually when I talk about these things, people make excuses. They say things like, oh, well, maybe you should have had a permit for selling on the beach. But those are just excuses. People did these things to me because I was black and they made the wrong assumptions about me. And they don't make those assumptions about white people like me. And that's not fair because that means that white people get an advantage that they didn't earn and black people get a disadvantage that they don't deserve. Exactly. It's really serious. Some people even get hurt when others think the wrong things about them. That's exactly why people are marching because when enough of us stand together, people pay attention. Right, because when we don't say anything, we're just letting it continue. Well, you listening and being supportive, that's helpful. It's important to keep reading and learning more about black history. And if someone is being treated unfairly, stand up for that person. If we all work together, we can make a big difference. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with me today, with us. Yeah, it's not easy, but it's necessary. All right. Well, uh, with that, um, I uh, thank you all. Uh, and we'll turn it over to Donna. Um, and I think we have uh, a few minutes for, for some questions. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks to all of you. Um, so I'm going to toss out one question um, for all of you, which is um, this conversation about diversity and inclusion is not new, right? It, I think for many, it feels new because of what we've been enduring in, in, in 2020. Um, and I would ask you, you know, first, 
do you think it's it's different? If it is, what's different? But how does how does it become sustainable? How do we sustain um, what your companies are doing? How do we sustain the conversation so that this is not a fleeting moment? I'll start with you, Michael. Yeah, um, that's a great question because it it is different, um, and I think it has done one of two things. It has either um, ignited for companies that may have um, maybe not paid much attention to the topic, they are now. And I think that's a great thing. Um, and I think for companies that are more established that, um, you know, as I mentioned before, kind of traditional diversity and inclusion, I think what it did is um, it accelerated a lot of the work that was maybe um, lingering or in the back burner. And, um, you know, I think from a sustainability standpoint, what it has done is ha it's shined a light and made it much more of a transparent conversation and much more of an authentic conversation because you have to be. And so I think the staying power is going to be, it's, it's driven the, the conversation, but also a lot of the initiatives to a place where you're out in front of it now, mm -hmm. not sort of leading from behind. Mm -hmm. Katie or Shabnam, do you wanna chime in? Yeah, I, I would add, um, I totally agree with everything Michael has said. It really has done all of those things. Um, I can certainly speak for um, what we're doing on the content side and a lot of my colleagues in the kids space are doing, which is critical to um, how our children are developing and the future of the country. Um, you know, uh, in, in our conversations around content, um, just a few years ago, it was okay for a creator to be a white person and create a show with a black lead. We can no longer do that. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we're, we were expecting authentic voices to be behind what is written so that those stories and experiences are authentic. Um, you know, and to that end, in my company, for example, one of our, the challenges we have is when we look for writers, for my last show, 16 Hudson, all I could find, unfortunately, this was about three or four years ago, were older white men who are experienced writers. Mm -hmm. I wanted experienced writers because I wanted obviously a good show. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we devised a training program ourselves and we're a small company with not much funding where we um, allowed for an Iranian, um, I'm sorry, an Indian Canadian, a Chinese Canadian, so these hyphenated immigrant populations to become junior writers. And now they have credits, they've written scripts, it's three or four years into the training program. So we always reserve a seat for what we call an observer and what we call the junior writer so that we're looking down and bringing other people into the conversation. And, and I think this applies wider, which is when you're looking at your companies, no matter what you do, um, look at the younger folks and try and fill in the spots in the departments where you don't have enough women, where you don't have enough diversity in how people look. And if they aren't there, then make it happen yourself. Right. I think everyone has that power. That's a great program. Thank you. Katie, did you want to add? Yeah. So I totally think it's different now um, with the commitment not just in Verizon, but all organizations. And I don't think it's going to lose any um, sustainability or anything because the conversations are so authentic and so real and impactful. We're having conversations where a year ago, year and a half ago, we would not have had race conversations. Mm -hmm. And everyone's wants to do something. So the holistic look across the organization is huge. And it's a fine line because people want to make an impact and it's trying to corral their passion and, and direct it a little bit. But we had very senior leaders make commitments around assessing systems, um, ensuring diverse candidate slates. And if they, you know, why, if there isn't one, why? Um, ensuring interview, diverse interview panels. So candidates can see who they, you know, see themselves in the, in the company. And I'm, 
it's been so amazing to see everyone's commitment and allies and the fear gone about having these conversations. Because that what that's why I developed a toolkit. I developed a racial equity learning plan to give people the resources to have these conversations. And um, people of color feel comfortable sharing their stories as well now, a lot for the first time. Great. So I know we ran over a little bit. I appreciate all the attendees staying on. I appreciate um, the contributions of all of our speakers today. Thank you so much. This was an important conversation. Um, we've been wanting to have this for some time. Um, I think we have one last slide that we can go to. Yes. So um, this week we um, are hosting our Kivertizing event, um, a two-day seminar of Kivertizing basics and best practices that will be presented by the KRU staff. Um, if you haven't yet registered, there's still time to register, so please do. Um, and again, our next and last KRU conference session will be on um, December 8th. So again, I thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Shabna. Thank you, Katie. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.